I'm a non-orthopedic surgeon. I'm a primary care sports medicine doc, and I am the uh, lead person in the sports concussion program here in sports medicine. I'm not here to recruit you to come and see me as a patient. <laughs> um, so I, I just want to talk about concussions in winter sports, and, and just thinking about, you know, we think about concussions in summer sports, we think about concussions in kids, and their high school teams, and then in, in, uh, in the college teams, but it's a lot more people in the winter, and it really is not just those organized sports. We think of skiing, hockey, basketball is a huge source of uh, business for me, but what about the fall on the ice? Those people are getting concussed too, and I think one of the problems with that is that a lot of the adults who are concussed are really good deniers. And um, hopefully, I'm going to turn you into less of deniers should you or your friend or family member get a concussion this year. So, take home point number one. This is of eight, so you know how long I'm going to talk. Take home point number one of eight is the guy on the left is probably a higher risk than the kids on the right. Especially if you didn't have a helmet on. I thought when I first pulled this off of web, he didn't have a helmet, but I believe he does have a helmet on. How do people get concussed? This guy is ready and waiting for a concussion. Um, you don't have to hit your head. So he might not hit his head when he goes down. He might just end up sitting hard on his butt. But he had a whiplash type injury to his neck and his brain sloshed around inside there. So it's, it's a myth that if you um, didn't hit your head, you didn't have a concussion. So I think that's really important to take home. That, that's, uh, <coughs> Yeah, most of the time, it is a hit to the head. It's an elbow to the head in basketball. It's uh, some sort of you know, object hitting the head or the head hitting the ground, but it's not always. And the rotational force makes a big, big difference. That is, when the head goes down, especially if there's anything from the side, that rotational force is really going to slosh that brain around. Um, one of the things I talk about when I see the kids who've had a concussion is the unexpected hit. This guy, here he is, walking from down the street with his cup of coffee. He should have known better, because if you look at this, what has he got on? He's got on these like, you know, regular old sneakers with nothing on there, and it's slick. But anyway, um, he should have known better, but he's unexpectedly falling. And that's what I see a lot is, is when I talk to the kids who've been injured, they didn't see the other person who was about to head the soccer ball. They didn't see the end, and they ended up having a concussion. If you're ready for it, you're sort of brace your head and your neck. You're going to do better. So basically, it's any fall on any slippery surface, of which there are a lot, hopefully not tonight on the way home. What about helmets? So I put required. Of course, it's not required for those adults going out and playing pond hockey, but it should be. You should really think about, you know, if you're going out with skates on your feet, and that's that's folks going out skating on Ockham Pond as well. If you're going out with skates on your feet, you ought to have a helmet on your head because you're likely to have those feet go up and your head go back. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, a lot of folks who are out there without helmets. Hockey, the kids have to wear helmets. Skiing, I'm um, really encouraged to see how helmets have really taken off and how people really are wearing their helmets. Um, what about which helmet? Uh, the, there's a lot of, we had something, I also take care of athletes at the college, and one of the parents, uh, a, a friend of a parent of lacrosse team said, you know, we can supply our special helmet insert to the lacrosse team for free, isn't that a great deal? And uh, we in sports medicine sort of thought about it and said, no, that's not a great deal because this person's going to go and advertise. The Dartmouth lacrosse team uses our helmet inserts and they didn't get any concussions. Probably had nothing to do with the helmet inserts and we didn't want to be part of their marketing campaign. So special helmets, not worth your money. You should just get a regular old helmet that is approved. There are several organizations that approve helmets. Um, doesn't have to be pretty, it just has to be functional. Um, they do need to be replaced periodically. Talk about bike helmets. If you've been in a bike crash, you should replace the helmet. Same thing for skiing helmets. Um, helmet add-ons, the sort of padding that goes on the outside, or like this thing I was talking about on the inside, really are not worth your money. So, take home point number two. I'll read it, but no helmet prevents concussion. They can help turn a potentially lethal head injury into a concussion more likely to prevent a more serious brain injury and don't spend extra money. 
What do I mean by that? The helmet is supposed to take the person who should have died from hitting that tree skiing and turn that brain injury into a concussion. So that's worth it. If they have a concussion, great, good for them. But they could have died if they didn't have a helmet on. So what about recognizing a concussion? Um, I think this is key and this is important for adults who are injured in a fall on the ice. Symptoms might not happen immediately. You might fall on the ice and go, yeah, I think I'm okay. And then uh, maybe I'm not as okay as I thought. And that could be hours later. So paying some attention to, you know, I don't quite feel right. I got this headache. And, you know, that's right. I did take that fall skiing this afternoon. Um, you don't have to lose consciousness. So, oh, I didn't lose consciousness, so it wasn't a concussion. No, that's not true. We used to have a grading score of concussion. This was a this bad concussion, this bad, and this bad. And you know how hard it is trying to figure out if somebody really lost consciousness, number one, number two, for how long? It's basically impossible to figure it out. So, fortunately, all of the loss of consciousness was dumped from the grading scale, which is really a huge relief to, to us. Really looking at symptoms in four different general areas. Migraine-like symptoms, sleep symptoms, emotional symptoms, and concentration or schoolwork. So in the migraine-like grouping of symptoms, headache, light and noise sensitivity, the person who has migraine likes to be in the dark and they don't want to hear loud noises. Uh, nausea, a lot of times migraine people can be nauseous and um, that fits with, with the migraine-like cluster. You don't have to have, you can have like one from category A and you know, three from category B, that sort of thing. The second cluster is sleeping, sleeping too much, not being able to get to sleep, sleeping too little, so some sort of sleep disturbance is common in those who've had concussion. Emotional, I don't see a lot of emotional stuff and when I do, it's sort of odd. I, feel, I actually have a gal at the college this afternoon who uh, was, in, uh, was concussed in a game this weekend and said she started crying right away. For no apparent reason, she started crying. And it's this sort of inappropriate crying or sometimes the parents will say, and my kid is just way more irritable than usual. Um, they're not their normal self. They're just uh, edgy. And the fourth one is concentration, which is trouble remembering, fogginess. This is where school issues show up for our kids. This is where your work is going to be affected if you're an adult trying to sit at a computer. I've separated balance and lightheadedness into like into a fifth, a stealth fifth category. Sorry about that. Um, because balance is really, really another way that we're looking at assessing concussions. People can feel off balance, they can be lightheaded, um, and they that's one of the things we can sort of measure, and not in a perfect way, but we can try to measure. So balance actually sort of belongs back in migraine life, but it's not migraine enough life, but I gave it a good category. Mm -hmm. Take on point number three. When in doubt, sit them out. So when I said that concussion symptoms don't happen immediately, you may not know whether this is going to be a serious injury and a significant concussion, until hours later. If somebody takes a bad hit, takes a bad skiing fall, you should be done. That should be it for the day. If it wasn't a concussion, great, good for you. You didn't risk a second injury. Um, so grown-ups, this is you too, and I keep saying this is for grown-ups as well, because we think about, so many times we think about concussion is just for kids. So you decide that this probably is a concussion, and you decide that you need to be seen. You might go to the ED if it's particularly bad. You think, I think this needs to be checked out in the ED. You might go to your regular doctor a couple days later. You know, I just, I don't know, it's just not right. I don't feel right. Um, so when, when we see you, we'll say, all right, you know, tell me about your history. What happened to you? Did you hit your head? Do you think you hit your head? Did, did you have a fall where you almost hit your head? Um, we're going to ask about previous concussions as well. What are your symptoms? We're going to go through those sets of symptoms, trying to say, okay, this person really looks like they're mostly migraine, or this person actually has more balanced symptoms. Uh, we're going to do a neurologic exam. 
And then this is this gets to my next take home point. Evaluation may or may not include imaging. People think that they need a CT scan, that if they're in the ED, they're in the emergency room because they need a CT scan. And there's actually very specific criteria, and I think our ED here does a really fabulous job of using those criteria to decide who needs that CAT scan and who doesn't. And there's a set of criteria, and they look at the patient very carefully, and if they say you don't need a CT scan, you don't need a CT scan. They're going to be really more, very careful to make sure they're not going to miss somebody who actually needs one. So um, I like that. There's a lot of small community hospitals who have a moonlighter, don't have somebody who's emergency medicine trained, who will say everybody who comes in with a possible concussion gets a CT scan, and that's a lot of extra radiation to a lot of people's brains. So I think being cautious about CT scans is smart. Um, Sometimes people come to me and they're asking for MRI. They want they want MRI to be done, and if we really very rarely, if ever, do MRIs. MRIs cost a lot of money, and unless you have what we call focal symptoms, that is symptoms that localize to one particular part of the brain, unilateral one-sided hearing loss, something that seems really kind of odd and one-sided, then we will consider MRI, but particularly we don't. So here I'm going to cheat a little bit. <coughs> my take home. My next take home point is there. Okay, I know. It's almost there. I forgot another slide. So, it, brain imaging. What are we looking for? If we're going to image the brain, we're looking for not a concussion. We're looking for something worse, something more serious than concussion. So, we're looking for bleeding into the brain. You do not want to have bleeding into your brain because what happens when you bleed into the brain? I don't think you can see this pointer, but see these central central structures? They're pushed off to the side. The brain doesn't really like that. It really kind of hates being sort of rearranged. And you get all kinds of symptoms. We call them the red flag symptoms. They are the kind of symptoms that any average normal person would say, that is not right, mm -hmm. that person needs to be in the hospital. So you're not going to miss the symptoms of a serious shift in the brain um, so you shouldn't feel like, oh no, I have to remember what all these things are. You don't. Um, and there's a couple different kinds. You can see here, uh, this is called epidural on the left, the dura. You can't see this thing. So here's the dura. This is the blue here. Dura is this fibrous tissue that surrounds the brain. Epi means on top of. Epidural means that the bleeding is on the outside of that fibrous tissue. This is where some blood vessels have torn, and that is critical. These guys bleed quickly, they go unconscious, they stay unconscious, it's very clear that something bad happened to this person. Subdural hematoma, Ronald Reagan had this uh, incidentally when he fell from a horse. Subdural hematoma is underneath the dura and these accumulate much more slowly. So the person sort of changes their mental status over days, not over hours or minutes. And then there's bleeding inside into the brain. So on CT, if you're going to get a CT of a concussion, you see none of these things. Zero, nada, the brain looks normal. So take home point number four. Here's where I cheat a little bit. Four, just because you had a normal CT scan does not mean it's not a concussion. Four and a half. Because you did not need a CT scan does not mean it's not a concussion. And four and three quarters, sorry. There is no imaging test to diagnose a concussion. So I think this is important. These are important take homes. I see patients, I had a patient in my other, my regular clinic come in and say, well, she was goofing around on the escalator with some friends at a conference. We won't say if it was lubricated or not. Uh, but she ended up having an injury, and she went to an ED in another state, and they did a CT scan of her head, and she came in two weeks later and said, just not right. I just don't feel right. I don't feel right. But I know it's not a concussion because I had a normal CT scan. I'm thinking, okay. Well, I got to start at stage zero here and do a little bit of education. There really was a concussion. She had all the symptoms of concussion. She had a normal CT. And for two weeks, she'd been thinking that I must be fine because the CAT scan was fine. Uh, so I think it's a really important take home point because people come in all the time saying, what about the CAT scan? I had an argument with a mother on the phone with a Dartmouth kid last week. I want the CAT scan. Why? Because somebody in my community died from a concussion. Well, it actually turned out to be not a concussion. It turned out to be brain aneurysm. Nothing to do with concussion. She was all worried. So uh, I spent a fair amount of time talking people out of that. Okay, so 
treating concussion. When I see somebody, what are we going to do with this person? How do we treat them? What What is our uh, treatment? Because you're thinking, okay, how do you heal the brain? You heal the brain with brain rest. Brain rest means I shouldn't be looking at this screen if I have a new concussion. I should be sitting away from screens. I certainly should be looking at that small screen of a, of a cell phone. Um, and that is just sort of taking you away from things that are brain irritants where you have to read, where you have to concentrate. And this is hard because this is taking kids out of class. What's also not new is physical rest. We also tell them you cannot exercise. You're, I don't care if you're on the sports team and this is your major competition week. You're not exercising this week because increasing the blood pressure, increasing blood flow to the brain can irritate it if you have a new concussion. We also emphasize sleep. That is, I tell people that sleep is crutches for your brain. If you have an ankle injury, you're going on crutches. If you have a head injury, you're going on sleep. And just to think of it as your brain is just craving this down to just let it shut down and let it sleep. And actually, you know, a lot of times people come in and they have been sleeping a lot. Okay, that's really great. Can you sleep more? Uh, and this, of course, gets in the way of your job, gets in the way of the kids' school, but it is so important early on. What's new on newer that we're talking about a lot in national meetings is so-called return to learn. Return to learn is, so you can't take somebody out of class and say, okay, you're going to sit in that corner, you're going to do nothing in the dark for a week, and then you can go back to school full time. Same thing for our adults. You're going to go and you're going to lay low, you're going to sleep a lot, sleep a lot. Okay, work full time, eight hours. It, there has to be some sort of transition program towards that return to work, return to learn. And the transition looks like first they start with 15 minutes of reading. You look at your screen or you're looking at your book, and you read for 15 minutes, and that's about it. And then, oh, take a break. And that could be it for the day. Once you get to 30 minutes or so, then it's okay to start transitioning back to school or work, but you're not going to sit in front of the computer eight hours for the first day back if you're an adult going back to work. You're going to go back, you're going to take some significant breaks. So this transition, which is kind of what we've been doing for transition for return to play for a long time, but now we're trying to structure a little bit return to learn. The schools all want, how do I do this? When do I send it back? How do I send it back? Give me the in the nitty gritty. The other thing that's new, sort of new in, in concussion, is that doing zero exercise is really hard. Anybody who's ever tried to keep a nine-year-old from doing anything would know that it's impossible to keep them from climbing on the sofa or doing whatever. And parents come in and go, oh, I'm a bad parent because I, you know, I haven't kept my nine-year-old you know, tied up and doing nothing. And the answer is, it's probably okay to be somewhat physically active. We actually think that after about three week mark, adding in exercise may be helpful in terms of those people taking a long time to get better. So it's it's not necessarily true that you can do nothing. You can go for a walk, probably is fine, as long as you're not getting worse headache, you're not getting worse symptoms from whatever you did. Take point number five, return to learn is progressive learning challenges. Like return to play, you don't progress until you pass the last step. Return to play is you have to pass each step. Um, and I don't know if this, Molly, the slide's going to be available? Uh, they won't, but I can make them available. Through okay. Um, I just have a couple of, if anybody's interested, they could contact Molly and uh, have a couple of links here. This is a link to the Brain Injury Association of Vermont's Return to Learn Protocol. It's really great. I give it out a lot. Um, and the other part of the take home point is adults, this is you too. You can't just go right back and sit at your computer and expect it's going to be fine. So I see a lot of people who aren't getting better. The reason that they come to the sports concussion program, so that the, con the consultant, is because they've done all this stuff and they're not getting better. And it's late week three and they're going, what? Why can't I get better? What's missing? Something's wrong here. I must need the CAT scan. And uh, yeah, so um, so what I really what I look at is okay. What are we missing here? We must be missing something. Sometimes it is the quality of their sleep. That is, they the, the sort of screwed up adult brain is just going. I can't figure out how to go to sleep. And sometimes people need sleep aids. 
Benadryl is a great sleep aid. I use other sleep aids. But sometimes you need sleep, just like the over overstimulated kid. They you know they need sleep. They're like ready to crash, but they won't go to sleep. Your brain won't turn it off. So improving the quality and quantity of sleep can make a difference. For my collegiate athletes, it's the quantity of sleep com commonly. They're staying up too late. Some of the high school kids, same thing, staying up too late. Um, Sometimes it's the workstation, sometimes it's computer screen. You want the screen to be as big as possible. The smaller the screen, if you're looking at a video on your cell phone, you are in trouble. Because that is, your eyes are trying to focus on a very small focal point and they, it's just too much for them. Whereas they may be able to tolerate that if it was on a big screen across the room. So I sort of, you know, plug your computer into the biggest screen you possibly can and try and do your reading across the room. Not, definitely not on your phone. Lighting needs to be similar to the lighting of the rest of the room. Looking at a computer screen in the dark is really bad for your eyes and just confuses your brain into, I don't know, not knowing whether it's light or dark out, but those people who are trying to not disturb their roommate and have their laptop open on their bed doesn't work very well. Um, a lot of the people who aren't getting better, the, the answer is in their balance. That is, they are sort of off balance, and that balance is triggered just like you would be triggered when you are motion sick. You're motion sick, you're triggered by all this visual input. They get triggered by the visual input of the computer screen. And so trying to make sure that it's not a balance and, and visual is um, worthwhile. And I send a lot of people to balance and vestibular <coughs> physical therapy. There is such a thing. Donna Pigeon is a therapist here, does an awesome job with the patients that I send to her, and often that's what's missing. Sometimes it's this on the bottom, exercising too soon and too hard. Um, and sometimes people have a heart rate threshold. One of the very first patients I took care of with concussion had was a cyclist who'd been in a crash. And he basically had a heart rate threshold. If he exercised underneath his heart rate threshold, he was fine. As soon as he crossed that heart rate, whatever it was, he got dizzy. And we just had to kind of slowly, slowly, slowly increase his, okay, maybe now you can do a heart rate of, and eh. it took him more than months to get back. But he was exercising, he just had to be aware of that threshold and not go beyond it. Here's another reason why some people aren't getting better. It's because it's not their head, it's their neck. Um, concussions, because you had a whiplash injury, may have also involved your neck. And Typically, this isn't enough to require imaging of the neck. You didn't go to the ED and say, oh, it's my neck. You went and said, oh, it's my head. Um, but if, if the ED has any concerns, believe me, they're very good at deciding who needs a, a neck imaging. If you have a neck injury, muscle injury, this can be a real cause for persistent headaches. So sometimes we see people who the only remaining symptom is headache. And they're being held out, held out, held out, can't do your sports, can't participate because you still have a headache. Well, in fact, the headache may not be from their head. It may be muscle tension headache from their neck. So we have them consider physical therapy, and I want to teach you my next take-home point. This is my very favorite neck stretch. I want everybody to try it. So this is, I call this the headrest stretch. You imagine yourself driving, putting your head on the headrest and keeping your eyes on the road. Your chin is going straight back. Your eyes are staying facing forward. So what you're doing here is you're stretching back behind, you can go straight back, and then you can tip and tip. You do a really nice stretch of the muscles in the back of your neck if you do the posterior glide first, the headrest stretch. So let's take home point number six. <coughs> um, return to play. I mentioned return to play already. This is here's another link, but the CDC has a great website, a part of their website. If you go into cdc.gov and you put in Concussion, or you put in Heads Up, is the name of their program. They uh, are celebrating 10 years of this particular website right now. Um, and they have this structured return to play. It's five days or five steps. If you can't complete the step in a day, then it's longer than a day. Example is, you don't have hockey practice every day. You only have hockey practice three days a week. So you can't go through all of the progression steps unless you've done that particular step, you can't move on. Um, if you get symptoms on one day, you stay at the last 
day or a progression that you could tolerate. So if sometimes it takes longer than five days, you can't do two days in one day. So this is a uh, point for adults. Take on point number seven is adults, you can't just go back to pond hockey the next day after your headache is gone. At least you shouldn't. Um, because you really should do a graduated return to play. So I get a lot of questions about this, and this is my last part of the talk, is how do we decide how many is too many? When does the pop-up timer go up, ding, you can't play mm, anymore because you've had too many concussions. And I get a lot of questions about this, particularly from parents. Is it three and done? Well, he's had two previously, so this must be his last one, right? And the kid's going, please don't, please don't, please don't, please don't. Um, it, you know, is it, is it four? Is it 12? Is it 16? Is it one? So I just want to share with you two cases. This is in the recent past. And just to illustrate the kind of range of return to play disqualification scenarios that, that I uh, have been dealt with in the recent past. Case number one is a collegiate lacrosse player who is on documented concussion number four. He clearly had this concussion clearly happened several weeks ago, and he is now less than two weeks into this concussion, and he is fine. He is 100% participating in all of his activities at school. Um, he is, he passed our impact test, which I didn't mention impact test. We can talk about it in the question and answer if you want. He has done everything, and he is ready to go, return to play. Oh, but by the way, he probably had maybe, I don't know, 16, 18, we don't know how many hits when he was playing PB hockey. When, so when he was a little kid, he said, oh, I was kind of a little kid. I got hit a lot. And I had my bell rung and I saw stars. So I'm thinking, okay, so this is four or is this 24? I don't know. <coughs> so I let him return to play because he had, each time he had a concussion, documented concussion, he had a rapid return to 100% normal, very short period of time, and I didn't see any reason why he should be held out. Case two is a um, high school hockey player who is on concussion number two. She had a concussion two years ago, which kept her out of school for a month. No school, whole month. She then slowly returned to play, but she never made it back to hockey season because it was over. The following year, last year, she got out on the ice and she was too dizzy to even skate. She sat out all of last year. And now this year, she sustained a concussion in field hockey. She's been out already for between two and three weeks. She's just getting back to going to school. So what do you think I did with her? Do you think I sent her back to play? Yeah, sure, hockey season is starting really soon. You can go back, you know, have at it. Because you're going to be better by then than hockey. You know, it's only a few weeks from now. I think you'll be fine by then. No, she was disqualified. I said, you may not. You're done. You're done. At least for this season, you're done. And potentially, permanently, you're done. Because she had proved that she took a very long time to get better from her first concussion, maybe never got better. Now she's got a second concussion, and she's still not better yet. I don't care if it's number two. You're done. So these are just two drastic cases, and these are real cases that happened to me within the last month or two. So I think it, this is a really hard decision. So take home point number eight is there's no evidence-based rules on disqualification. We make these decisions based on our best judgment and the best interest of the athlete. We take into account the, how long it's taken for them to get better. We take into account the interval since the last concussion. We take into account the injury mechanism because sometimes the injury mechanism becomes lesser and lesser and lesser and lesser. They just got jostled outside their locker, didn't have their head hit anything, and all their symptoms are back. So um, this is a really hard decision, and I've illustrated two cases that are pretty drastically different, both of which I thought were pretty straightforward and most of the cases aren't that straightforward. So finally, I'm done. These are some resources. The cdc.gov slash concussion slash heads up. This is the, the 10 years site. This has everything for everybody. It has stuff for me, the clinician. It has stuff for you, the patient, the parent, the teacher. There's a, there's a section there for everybody. Um, and then last thing is when we do concussion education, we 
We give the parents, while the kid is off doing their concussion test, we give the parents a link to this YouTube video. This is called Concussion 101. It's a whiteboard talk where the artist is just you know, doing like this and erasing and doing like this and erasing. It's six minutes long. It's awesome for concussion education, just to understand what a concussion is. You can go to YouTube. You don't have to watch all that. You do all that. I see people frantically writing down. Go to YouTube and put in whiteboard concussion or concussion whiteboard and you will get here. Thank you.